we have experiments with generative AI, by the way, but I think it has a lot of inherent flaws that I don't think it'll ever overcome. Uh, the biggest one is human intention. Like, I don't think it's possible for you to actually crack human intention with generative AI because the stuff just comes out of the ether. I mean, you can get closer to having a human guide the process, but you'll never be able to tell me what you're about to get. Today's guest is the founder of one of the coolest startups I have ever seen. Devesh Naidu is the founder and CEO of Simulon, a company based in South Africa, who is creating something pretty mind-blowing. The short version is Simulon is an app that makes very high-end visual effects accessible to almost anyone. The technology behind it and the implementation from what I've seen so far are astounding. In this conversation, I asked Devesh a million questions about the software his team is building, his vision for the future of visual effects and compositing, and what it's like building a startup like this in South Africa. This might be one of the nerdiest episodes we've ever done, and I love every second of it. So here's Devesh. Devesh, dude, it is so awesome to have you on the podcast. I have been stalking you on Twitter for a little while now, and I cannot wait to hear more about Simulon. So thank you for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to share. Um, we're at an, a really exciting point uh, with the company and our team. Yeah, I was super excited to get it out to the world. That's awesome. So the product is called Simulon, and you know, it's, you've know it's you been a little bit cryptic about it. You can't actually, at this point, as of this recording, go out and download it and use it, but you're posting these renders, I guess, from it, and some of it looks like it's almost live captures of the interface. And the quality of what you've done is pretty mind-blowing. Um, so maybe, you know, th th people are going to be watching this. People are gonna also going to just be listening to it. Maybe you could kind of give the elevator pitch and explain what is Simulon? Like, what's the point of it and what does it do? Sure. I mean, um, you know, our goal with this really is to make high-end visual effects as accessible and intuitive as possible. You know, our, our target with this, our target audience with this is really independent creators because we are independent creators. So we were building it for ourselves. We started building this for ourselves, essentially. And I think... You know, that's, you know, people will start to realize that uh, more and more. Um, we aren't from a tech background. You know, none of us, are, none of us are like a big tech, formerly worked at Google and Amazon, all these places. Um, we are actually creative people. Um, and these are, you know, challenges that, that we've faced personally. Um, they mean a lot to us. Um, you know, there's a emotional struggles that we've been through as creators. And I think it's just, something we've all felt that like when it comes to visual effects, you know, it's like almost the ultimate medium to express our dreams um, in a way that's so visceral that other human beings can suspend disbelief and sort of just fully take it in and say, I'm part of the story. I believe it hundred um, percent. But it's also the most difficult thing to do, uh, like logistically, the cost factors, like the resources requires. Mm. There's so much skill involved and there's so many like labor intensive, tedious processes and our goal was like, how can we remove as many of those things so that creators don't have all these amazing ideas that just become, you know, a note on like their Apple Notes or like a little in their sketch pad and it just stays there forever and never materializes in the world. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Got it. Okay, so let me try to describe what I think Simulon is, and then you can you can correct me and tell me what sure. I'm missing. So from what I've seen online, it looks like uh, an app that runs on an iPhone. I don't know if it also runs on Android, but definitely runs on an iPhone. And it's essentially a camera app, so you can go around and shoot footage with it, but at the same time, you can use it to capture lighting information about the room or the environment you're in, which then somehow through magic, it turns into an HDR. So then you can kind of in real time, I think, pre-visualize the, the tracked position and, and everything of a 3D object that isn't there in real life, but you can place it where you want it. Simulon somehow knows the geometry of the environment you're in, so you know it can cast shadows and it can do things like that. And then somehow once you're done and you kind of get your shot, it then creates a high-res render fully composited in the cloud. And the quality of the renders... I have to tell you, it's it's astounding. I mean, it looks like something right out of ILM, you know. And th there's another company right now called Wonder Dynamics that is doing something similar, I think. And the quality of the renders for Wonder Dynamics is is great. I think Simulon's better. 
So, uh, so how did I do? Did I did I explain the app? Is there pieces <laughs> I'm missing, or are there things I got wrong? Yeah, I think ultimately, you know, the the visual effects workflow, the whole pipeline is so fragmented right now. Um, you know, when you want to create a, a, a piece of content, you have an idea. Um, to get from an idea to like, a, you know, a really polished mm -hmm. final piece that you can consider something I would be proud of sharing, something that moves me as well. The steps in between, there's just so many things and they're all so separate. Um, it's often even a deterrence from people experimenting with kind of nonchalant ideas, which I'd say a lot of the stuff that you've seen online. I mean, these have literally been like videos that I did like in between a really busy day with so much going on, like building the company, doing meetings, UX design and stuff. And it's like a little, you know, half hour gap. And I'll be like, oh, I'll create that. That'll be cool to illustrate this. And then I just go make it really quickly. And I mean, you could never, um, you can never consider doing something like that with the current visual effects workflow, like the nonchalant, oh, I want to make this idea. Um, and you just go ahead and do it and nothing really stops you from doing it. And that's, you know, that's the thing we wanted to solve there is like all those fragmented pieces could we streamline it into one like really intuitive workflow that's taking more of a comprehensive approach as opposed to saying like, you know, we're doing this specific tool um, or we're making this specific part of the pipeline more efficient or better, or easier to use. Mm -hmm. And I think like, you know, you brought up Wonder Dynamics, for example, and I'd say, um, you know, they're doing amazing work um, and, you know, props to them. Um, it's really cool that you know, you can replace a real human with a digital character. And I think it has its really specific use cases. You know, if you want human interactions, like a human interacting with another human being, you might have seen a lot of their demos um, where they sort of replaced one human with a robot wh while they're interacting with another human being. Yeah. And that stuff's really cool. And I think that's a specific use case where like AI in painting plus estimating the body positions and stuff makes a ton of sense. Um, but I think the, you know, Wonder Dynamics is a lot more human centric in its approach. Like it's about replacing a human in the frame, um, post process, estimating all of those things and then giving you an output as if it was being performed by this virtual character. Um, but it's again focused on a humanoid character. Um, and that's amazing for certain use cases. But our idea was really to be as generalizable as possible. So, you know, if I want, dragons and dinosaurs and, and I mean dinosaurs is where this all came from but we'll talk about that <laughs> yeah a, a, a bit later you should be able to do it anything that comes to mind so the iPhone app um, is really you know it's it's really the base where we said what's uh, as accessible to as many people as possible not everyone has a cinema camera at home um, you know people have iPhones iPhones in many ways are more powerful than cinema cameras you know we can do a lot of computational photography stuff uh, there's a lot of you know, on device processing that we can do real time tracking and things that you can't do with the, just a camera. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to leverage all of those things because certain elements are solving parts of the visual effects pipeline, but not all of it. And the unsolved parts are arguably the <laughs> harder parts to solve. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty bold approach. Like, you know, as a small team, we said we, we want to make this possible. We, in theory, like, here's what we want to do and it all checks out. Um, we had to design a lot of proprietary stuff to do it. So, um, you know, one of the things, for instance, is a scene interchange framework that is able to uh, translate and uh, work with more data streams than your standard, uh, you know, industry standard USD, GLTF, and all of these file transfer formats. And that allows us to get, you know, data from the iPhone um, to the 3D, to the cloud render, create this parity. Um, and also reference assets based on a variant system that we had to build. So obviously the mobile experience needs to feel like any other mobile app you would use. Right. Um, you know, if, if it takes forever to load things, to download assets, to get them in a scene, if your phone is like overheating in two seconds and then everything starts slowing down, it's pointless. You know, it's not a usable experience. Um, so we had to make it so all of that stuff runs like, a native app. It should feel like a native app. The UI should feel native. The experience should feel super fast. Um, like for instance, the head, uh, model that I, that I shared yesterday with uh, the 3D scan store head model. I mean, that's a, that is a massive asset. It's 16K textures. It's like insane. But the variant that gets generated automatically for a system on the device, it downloaded in like two seconds on my phone. Uh, you know, instantiating is incredibly fast. It it's like, really easy to work with. Um, 
and then you know the, the the cinematic variant of the asset is ultimately what's streamed into the um, the render pipeline in the cloud. So yes, there is a there's a real time AR component and there's a uh, post to render component, which is where all the high frequency detail comes from. And there has been some confusion, understandably, around that because I think there's never b before been such a seamless sort of uh, blend between AR and then you know producing like a, an offline render. So it's naturally confusing people. Like it feels, you watch the videos, it feels so handheld and real time almost that it could trick your mind and you could think like, oh, this is an AR experience. And I think some people um, maybe fully didn't understand when I was talking about like your real time on device previews versus cloud rendering. And it gets quite crazy, obviously, when a couple of posts go viral and then people take it and they have their own spin on it yeah. on social media and they're like, this is real time AR. It's like, it's crazy. And then um, that was really the purpose of the video that we released yesterday was to show the difference between what you actually see when you're authoring content on device versus what the final render is. Yeah. So yeah, you pretty much, uh, you, you pretty much got it spot on. Cool. There. Well, it's funny. So I, I was talking to um, a friend of mine who's been working with us at School Motion, and I was raving about Simulon. I'm like, have you heard of this thing? You got to check it out. And he goes, yeah, I looked. And I think what he saw, he saw one of the preview videos where it was you were showing, this is what it looks like while you're filming. And, you know, yep. and the way you explained it, it's really helpful. So now I understand, okay, you're not using the the full version of the asset, the 3D asset. You're using probably down -resed textures, and I'm sure you're not doing subsurface scattering in real time and stuff like that. So that's what he saw, and he said, yeah, it looks really cool, but the quality of the render wasn't really that great. And I go, yeah, you that probably wasn't the final render, because every final render I've seen looks flawless. And, you know, we're so this is a visual podcast, if you're watching this on YouTube, and we're going to be cutting in clips of this. You recently posted a clip that blew my mind, uh, and it was the amber, uh, piece of amber with a little bug in it sitting on the table, kind of the Jurassic Park, you know, mosquito trapped in amber thing. But you were moving an iPhone with the flashlight turned on around to the back side of it, and you were getting this beautiful light casting through it and shadows on the table, and it looked 100% real to me. Like, the first time I saw it, I actually thought maybe you were playing a trick on me. Like, it was like, uh, maybe that's just real. <laughs> He's pretending it's not there. It, you know, and I want to get into the tech a little bit more, but before we go too deep into the tech yep. and, and how all of this works, I'm really curious about your background because uh, you mentioned that you don't come from the tech world, and, you know, and I don't know much about your background, but Simulon seems like a very high tech thing. And so I'd love, why don't we start kind of from the beginning? Like, tell us about your background. Like, how did you you know, how did you encounter the world of animation and visual effects and, and how did that lead you here? Sure. I think the first thing, like uh, before I even start on that, the first thing that's important to note is we have an unbelievable team that's working on this in South Africa. So, you know, I'm one part of the team and we're all, you know, contributing incredible, incredible stuff to make this possible. Um, but yeah, my, my, my personal background is 3D animation and visual effects and software. So, uh, most of it is self-taught. I did study um, for like a year and a couple of months at the animation school in Cape Town, which is an amazing, amazing place. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a three-year course, which I didn't I didn't complete at the time. And I think I was um, like most students <laughs> studying animation. You know, had that unhealthy obsession of like pushing myself to three, four in the morning, yeah. like every single day, and like I just want to make things amazing, and I want to. You know, just striving for the stuff that you see, like the ILMs again, and that you're you're wanting to get as close to possible, uh, as close as possible to that kind of uh, final output. And yeah, the the animation school is a lot more focused on the one in Cape Town is a lot more focused on 3D animation, full um, CG animation, mm -hmm. Pixar style, most of his stylized kind of focus, which is really amazing, obviously for like other world D type stories. But I was naturally more drawn towards the visual effects side. Yeah. So after hours, I was just like learning all these other things, motion tracking and compositing and everything. And then, yeah, it didn't make sense for me to continue, but uh, this this was clearly my passion. Um, and it this all got kickstarted actually before that even was Jurassic Park. I could say Jurassic Park, the first one, that was really uh, what got me into all of this stuff. Um, it so strongly sits with me to this day. Like I feel it every time I watch the film. It just hits me every single time. It's a top 10 movie um, for me. I, for remember, sure. yeah. I remember when I first watched it, I was just... I couldn't believe it, you know, and I, I mean, it was 
the first Jurassic Park, I think, came out a year before I was born. I think it was 19. I was going to ask you how um, old you were because I'm like, you're you're a lot younger than me. And I remember seeing that. I think it came out in 93 or 94 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So so I watched it when I matured to a point that I could make sense of it. All. Yeah. And then <laughs> I, I was just blown away. It felt like, how how is this possible? I needed to know, like, how was this done? <laughs> you know, and I was lucky enough that, like, um, you know, coming from an Indian family, um, my parents are not very traditional in that way, that they were like, cool, um, animation, sure. Uh, you know, even though my dad's a doctor and like, it's kind of, you know, Indians are very focused on like the academic side of things, right. like accountants, doctors, all the traditional. And they were like, cool, go for it. Like go to Cape Town, do it. Um, and then I came here, I, you know, I studied and I was like, this is definitely the stuff that I love doing, but I'm diverging from like what the, the actual school is teaching. And I had ideas for things I wanted to do. Like I wanted to build new things. I was like, there's so much innovation that can happen in the space. Like I just see data everywhere um, because, you know, self-taught just out of interest to me is also, you know, programming. And I was always very fascinated by developing software and the fact that we can communicate with a computer, ask it to do things ultimately, and we can sort of change the course of an industry potentially just by doing that. And that always fascinated me. So that was really, you know, leaving um, at the animation school uh, was again, I think called my parents while I was in Cape Town and they were in a different city. And I'm like, I'm going to drop out and go start a company. Love it. And they were like, okay, you know, we're not going to support you though financially. So if you're comfortable, Good luck. you can do it, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I, I went off um, and then started my first company, which is Dondu Studios, actually. Um, that was now 2013, I think 2013, 2014, somewhere there. So nine, 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, it was part visual effects. We worked on a lot of visual effects stuff in the commercial industry in South Africa, which is, you know, quite big. We've got quite a big commercial industry here. And, um, and then the other part slowly started to get into the tech side. And that was around, if you remember the timeline, that was kind of like uh, VR renaissance with the Oculus DK1 when it first came out. Um, and I managed to get my hands on one in South Africa. And the first time I tried it, a VR, like anyone, the first time you try VR, you're like, oh my God, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. This is really cool. And uh, I think I then try to figure out, okay, how do I, like, this is the future because the Jurassic Park experience, like the thing that moves you as a human being, like take away all the tech and like all the passion for visual effects and everything. The thing that moves you as a human being is like, I suspend disbelief and this thing is real and it's a story from someone else's mind and I'm a part of it. Mm -hmm. And it always felt to me like, you know, when, when the, when the T-Rex is walking past his, uh, the kid's bedroom and the swimming pool is there, like if I was actually in that room, like what would that feel like? Um, and I think that's like kind of the, been the promise of VR is it could take us closer to that thing. I knew that it was far away from, you know, reaching that kind of level of immersion. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to find a way to build a company around this because I felt like this was the future of where things were going. On the uh, the point sort of pre the call started when you asked me around like the startup ecosystem in South Africa versus the US. I think that's the first sort of example. My first startup, I had no experience. I was 19 years old. And I was like, okay, how do I get this going now? You know, there's no sort of VC um ecosystem here in the sense that like everything is very risk averse in South Africa. So right. it's like very like SME focused and it's about yeah, building businesses that are like working with you know corporate sponsors and things like that. There's no real culture around innovation, unfortunately. And that kind of made me think about how I need to build a sustainable business that like can start making money from day one. Um, and then slowly, I mean, the idea was then, can we slowly like reinvest into the ideas that we actually care about? That's actually not I how mean, most VC backed startups work. They're not supposed to make money for a long time. So that's interesting that you, you, you basically were forced to figure out how could this make money, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the thing is with something that inherently like something that's really new, you're not going to make money from day one. You know, right. you need to educate people and you need to get it out there and, 
explain why this is valuable and build a community and all of that stuff. A services business, obviously, you can make money from day one if you're solving people's problems, other people's problems, um, companies' problems. Sorry, let me put it that way. Right. You've got a B2B solution. And that was what we were, Dondu. Like, we ended up building a relatively, in South African terms, relatively successful business um, that was op operating at the cutting edge. So we built VR training simulators for the industrial mm -hmm. sector. And it was all about offsite training. But even with, even with that, we, you know, we really, we had that, we want to push it all the way. Like how far can we take this stuff? We built physical, like physical rigs, um, you know, six off rigs with microcontrollers moving people in space and had the, you know, the actual, uh, controls all synced to the VR headset. So what you're seeing in, in VR, you're actually touching in real life. Um, and then we went and LIDAR scanned like underground mines in Africa. So we'd go to Zambia and things, scan the mines, um, and have a physical, like a digital representation, oh, sorry, wow. a digital double of the space and then run a physics sim. So if you're, for instance, operating like a dozer underground, you would go into the experience as if you were actually there, learn how to operate it. It's as close to possible uh, to the real life as possible. Um, and you can do that without, without all of the sort of health and safety risks. And that was the, you know, value proposition of what we were doing. And yeah, we did, we did some pretty cool stuff. I mean, we brought in like the first motion analysis rig, um, you know, 42 camera, uh, uh, motion tracking volume in South Africa. And we had like real time VR with human body motion tracked and everything at, I mean, nine years ago, I think this stuff was still pretty far out there, even globally. So yeah, that's, that's kind of. The first thing, and then I realized over time, like as the years went by, that you know I'm losing sight of the stuff that I'm actually passionate about, which is not mining. Right. <laughs> you know I'm passionate <laughs> about the creative industry, and it's not that wheel is not turning. You know it's not actually becoming the thing that I wanted it to become. And and I think you know I I I've, I'm lucky enough as well to have a really really supportive partner in my life. Um, actually, Elsa Bleda, you might have seen her. She's part of our team. Oh, cool. Very, very lucky to have her. And yeah, she, you know, she also, to be very honest, I've been very lucky, actually. You know, I think back in my career overall, um, she was a really good space, you know, um, as a creative, independent creative. And uh, financially, she could support us to take the risk to say, like, you know what, actually, just go after the stuff that you're passionate about. Like, do it. Let's, like, just sit down and let's build. And that's what we did. You know, I left my previous company and it was just started off like that, just a MacBook and an iPhone. Uh, like this was like an iPhone seven at the time and like a, you know, refurb MacBook Pro and started building from there, you know, and it was just always this towards this vision of can we make visual effects a really accessible and intuitive experience? Can we bring the fun parts to it, like highlight the fun aspects? and let people create. And I've got some videos. Um, I mean, I'll actually uh, I'll probably share some side-by-sides of like when we first started, like what those clips looked like and what they look like now. And they were actually pretty good when we first started out. Um, you know, they, 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 they weren't too bad. But like clearly the discrepancies between what you could achieve in real time versus, you know, what an offline renderer is capable of doing it's massive. I mean, those are worlds apart, as you know, right. better than most. You know, it's massive. For now, for um, now. <laughs> and it be yeah, I mean, the thing is, it becomes even more complicated when you start talking about things like fur systems and, you know, uh, characters with dynamic hair right, and things right. like that and subsurface scattering and all of the stuff, refraction and, uh, you know, part caustics, guiding, caustics all that stuff, yeah. and all of this stuff. And we were like, you know, we have to bridge that. Like it, we need to make it so that the creative experience is like this. It's super accessible, super intuitive, super easy. And the outputs, which is what people care about, is just by default amazing. <laughs> you know, and how right. do we get to that point? So, yeah, that was like how then Simulon started. It was like, let's do this full time, focus on it full time. And then, yeah, we had a really interesting journey from there, but uh, yeah. I'm sure you've got a whole bunch more. Yeah, well, dude, this is really fascinating. And uh, it, real quick, I'm just curious. So when you did Dondu Studios and built, you know, essentially a VR company from scratch, how old were you when you did that? I was 19. 19, man, that is so impressive. You, you mentioned in the, the pre-interview questions, you mentioned your grandfather 
as one of your sort of inspirations, you know, it's, you're clearly an entrepreneur. That's there's no question there. I mean, can you talk a little bit about the impact of of him on your life and sort of, I mean, what you're doing is very difficult. <laughs> you know, like you didn't pick an easy startup. You're doing a great job. I'm I'm always curious when I meet people like you. Like, where did that come from? Did you were you always like this, or was there some event that happened? Like, with your grandfather? Like, tell me about it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think his the inspiration he's had in my life is a bit different, um, but equally as important. You know, he was he was one of the first um, photojournalists of color in South Africa, and this was during the apartheid regime. Mm-hmm. You know, he was he was a key figure, like in that political struggle. And actually, like Nelson Mandela, for example, former president, you know, he got arrested leaving my grandfather's house. They were all part of like same oh, wow. group. You know, he's he's in like you know, the Nelson Mandela Foundation, everything you can find, like my granddad's work there. That's incredible, man. Oh, wow. I actually never got, you know, I I never got to meet him. Um, He, he, you know, he passed away like a long time ago. He was very young, actually, when he did. And uh, I just sort of grew up with the stories, you know, and like all of his photographs of these moments. And I think photography is such a powerful medium, you know, it just takes you back to those times and you could look at it and think, you know, these were the things that my my granddad, to, together with all of these amazing people, were fighting for. And it's the freedom that I enjoy today. You know, it's like I could never think of building a company like this. You know, I could never think of like um, showing the world what, you know, South Africans are capable of doing as well. Like none of this stuff would be possible unless we had have the freedoms that we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you couldn't back then, like my parents couldn't study the stuff that I studied. They couldn't you know, pursue a career like I did. They didn't have the opportunities I did. Um, also, you know, globally, we've moved towards a direction where we've become a more global society and stuff. So there's other external factors as well. Um, but in terms of like an actual oppressive regime, you know, that they live through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my grandfather's super inspirational in the sense that he also, he was a very inclusive person in his approach, you know, Similarly, I mean, Nelson Mandela was obviously the ultimate um, right. w- when you think about that, like treat everyone equally and like let's move towards this equal society. There's less hate in the world and it's easier said than done, obviously. And I think it's more pertinent now than any time. I mean, there's a lot of agree really you, yeah. <laughs> horrible things going on yeah. in the world. Coming from that kind of family background and also just growing up in general in South Africa in a culturally diverse place that's beautiful, but also really highlights like social inequalities. I think it does shape the way you approach to building a company. So we are, again, I, I'd say you'd consider us outliers in building such an emerging tech product out of South Africa for a global audience. Um, but those values still come along with us. And I think that's becoming so important right now in the world is like, what is the intention of the people behind this thing? You know, I like, what it. are they actually trying to do? Where are they trying to go? Um, yeah. And I'd say... Yeah, that, that's the part that's influenced me more than anything is like, what mark are we actually leaving on the world? This is not just about creating a very successful company that makes a ton of money. You know, we want to change the lives of individuals. And I think that's, that's kind of, you know, he, he was a part of that, like change the lives of individuals. And like, for me, it's in the creative industry the thing I'm passionate about. How do we change the lives of individuals? You know, you know, a tool like Simulon, and, and we can get into the tool a little bit now. So I'm curious who it's aimed at, because when I look at it, you know, like I've done visual effects professionally and I know how to do match moving and, and all of that stuff. This abstracts a lot of that away and makes it much easier. And what I loved when I saw Wonder Dynamics come out, and for anyone listening who isn't familiar, Wonder Dynamics is, is a similar kind of idea. Um, but it's it like you, like Devesh said, it really is geared more towards replacing a human with a character, but it it does it basically without you having to do anything. It's pretty it's pretty remarkable. That seems to me like it's aimed at, you know, content creators or maybe maybe it's the kid who just saw Jurassic Park for the first time and thinks this is amazing, I want to make something like that. Um, it's not necessarily aimed at the professional visual effects artist that can use this tool like in their day-to-day work at, you know, ILM or Weta or something like that. Simulon seems like it's a little bit of a deeper tool, I think, from what I can tell. And I'm curious, is it aimed at, is this one of those things that democratizes visual effects for like, you know, my eight-year-old son who would love to be able to take my phone and run around and and chase an alien? Uh, Or is it designed for professional visual effects artists to make their lives easier, 
abstract match moving away. Now you don't even need to do it because the camera does it while you're shooting, like that kind of thing. Yeah, I think um, you know we really want this. We really want this to scale to um, you know the uh, sort of complexity that the end creator desires um, and the quality level as well. So we are also working on you know on the high end like integrations with external cinema cameras, so you can use the tool and sync that mm. data, and you can you know shoot with a Sony FX6 or whatever. Um, and now you've got all the benefits of what Simulon has to offer. You've got these real, in, you know, in-camera previews. You know, we can save um, locations in the world. You can remote all the content. Like, there's all those stuff as well that I haven't talked about, which I think you'll find really, really fascinating. I'll get into that now. Yeah. But yeah, it is, it is aimed for, one, if, you know, if, if all I want to do is I want to create something really, really cool in a physical location, I have an idea. I have no 3D skill whatsoever. Um, but I'm really excited to buy an asset from another 3D creator. So one of the things that we're wanting to do is create a marketplace where on the device you can access and you can see all of the amazing things that 3D artists build. Um, and you can use those characters, you can use those assets in the world. As a non-technical 3D artist, you can just create amazing content um, using the iPhone workflow. Everything's super intuitive. It takes like a couple of seconds to generate an HDRI, uh, you know, you place objects in the scene, you have that real in-camera preview. I think that's a, just to highlight that part as well. It's, you know, with AR, people take that for granted, but in a visual effects workflow, that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. I mean, you know, Simulcam was built for Avatar to solve this problem where like previously it was just guesswork, like, okay, the character's gonna be there and we gotta like kind of do this camera move and do the composition and stuff assuming we're going to get it right and hopefully mm -hmm. we don't get it wrong. If we get it wrong, we reshoot and it's all this like endless cycle. Um, seeing what you're shooting in real time is, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's a world of difference. So that's, that's just one aspect of it. But, but yeah, uh, going up from like the most basic, le basic way of creating um, to now I am a studio artist um, at home or I'm a small studio or a little group of friends or whatever, and I want to create something truly remarkable, and I want to have a lot of creative freedom. And I haven't been, like the demos I've been sharing, this is the part I'm super excited about, I haven't been creating like that. Like, and I know I, I could, I just don't have the time right now in between all the work. But if I were to actually take it serious and maybe like spend a week creating something, it could be truly mind-blowing. Um, we've built, we've got plugins for for uh, DCC tools, you know, we're gonna announce, we'll do an, a, a really amazing announcement around our Blender plugin first, um, which is again, Blender is like, we're big believers in Blender and the Blender project. And again, Blender is like a remarkable tool that's empowering individuals mm -hmm. and it aligns with our vision. And it's been our focus from the start is we want Blender creators to have superpowers now when they get their hands on Simulon. This just brings, it brings everything into Blender in like a minute or so. You know, we've got a number of modular ML pieces that work so nicely with the whole Blender system. Um, we also allow you to upload an asset um, as a full Blender scene. Um, so, you know, if you want to have an asset, again, that's got now fur systems and geometry nodes, dynamic geometry node systems and crazy stuff going on there, you can actually just upload the whole asset as a full blend file and we automatically in the back end generate the variants for you know cloud rendering wow. for real time all of that stuff it just gets done automatically and it's ready to use in like a couple of minutes you know you can be shooting just after you've uploaded something the plugin also has another amazing feature which i'm happy to like talk about now here because I think when we do announce it, in any case, it's going to be crazy when you actually see it in, in practice. But that scene interchange framework that we've built, it also stores data about the real world. So when you save a scene that you've created in Simulon, you can come back to that location. There was, uh, there was a little demo I did around this where I placed these like spider robots um, in different areas in the scene. And then I showed that I can like close the app and I can come back at any time, provided that my environment hasn't changed significantly. And it just re-anchors everything like where they're supposed to be. That data is actually stored in this proprietary like scene interchange framework that we've built. So when you open that scene in the, in the Blender plugin, for instance, you can start remote authoring content for a real world location 
with the same mesh reconstruction of that physical environment. Oh, wow. And then go back to that location and have that animation anchored in space correctly. And then you just use a simulon workflow again, you calculate the lighting, you shoot in real time. I mean, if you think about what that means, it's like, say for instance, I wanted to have such a specific animation of like the robot walking in this lounge and then, I mean, this, this living room and then going and like grabbing a book off the shelf and then sitting on this physical chair I've now got this mesh representation of the scene that I've created in real time from the device. I can open the scene in Blender and animate that character doing those very specific movements contextually to the space and then come back to this physical location on my device and see the, the character in the real world doing that contextually and then record it like that. And Devesh, just for people that, you know, like our audience is primarily motion designers who are doing design and animation. They also do a lot of compositing sure. and there's visual effects artists that listen. But the process that you just described, um, maybe you could talk about how would that traditionally be done if you needed to provide a 3D artist on the other side of the world a representation of the set that you're going to be shooting in. How would, that, how would that work now without something like Simulon? Sure. I mean, I think now you would probably have to go through like a photogrammetry software, for instance, use maybe something like uh, Polycam, mm -hmm. for example, which is really, really cool. You'd have scan a physical location, send, send that space to another artist around the world and have them animate, this, animate that sequence. You would then have to have some sort of like, I guess, marker that you would then physic, like in the physical world, you would say like the animation is a start here as well, mm -hmm. like at this, physical point, maybe a piece of tape on the floor or something. Um, and that artist would have to work from that point saying the character is going to start here doing this action. Then you would still not have, you know, when you're shooting it, you would have to just imagine like you would have to stand at the point of the tape right. and then think, okay, the character's here and I'm going to do this shot planning it so that I'm hoping the timing is going to be right. Right. <laughs> and you would probably have to send that plate hoping that you got it as close as possible to the timing of the animation, if you did it in parallel. Um, and then you'd have to adjust the timing of the animation, I guess, to fit the composition. Um, if you had to do that without, uh, I, I'm obviously talking about, you know, without motion control rigs and all of these right. things. This is like how you would, like an everyday creator or 3D artist with accessible tools would have to go about it. it yeah, I would say you probably wouldn't be crazy enough to try. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's really like fascinating because, you know, when you just explained how that works and, and I don't, it's funny because that's one of those things where, you know, you're talking about an, uh, an, a file exchange format. That's not the sexiest thing, but the use case for it is kind of crazy because, you know, uh, you know, in the last few years, um, shooting on these giant light stages, that's become really popular and that's, that helps, you know, with certain visual effects things. I have a feeling that tools like this are going to enable creators to do much more with like digital sets and things like that. But if you can create a digital set once and then that's anchored to the room that you shoot in and every time you open Simulon and look through it, you're seeing your set because it's always there. That's pretty remarkable, man. So, yeah. okay, so it does sound like you, you really are aiming at the non-professional eventually. Now, can this also be used by you know, professional compositors that work on feature films. Is that also part of the plan? Before we hear that answer, I have a question for you. Do you like being informed about the latest and greatest tools, trends, and news about design, animation, 3D, and visual effects? Of course you do, which is why you should be subscribed to our free weekly newsletter, Motion Mondays. This is a five minute email you'll get each Monday that will keep you up to date on new tools, great work, events, and news in the worlds of animation, design, 3D, and visual effects. Head to motionmondays.com to sign up for free. And now let's get back to the interview. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we're definitely, so, so the idea is like, you know, indie creators, I think will be really our core is we want to empower as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. But then we do, you know, we do want this to change the, the current professional workflow as well, which I think just hasn't evolved for a very long time. And, you know, we've, I've also worked in the professional industry for a long time. And if you look at the problems that's resulted in, like, well, not all of it, but I think some of the issues in the visual effects industry that we see today, which have come to a head recently with all the strikes mm -hmm. and like, you know, all of the, uh, this, uh, the salary drops and things is the model is broken, right? And, and part of the reason why it's broken is because the workflow and the pipeline is just so, it's so fragmented and it's so 
unintelligible. It doesn't cross boundaries very well between like live action filmmakers and like commercial stakeholders and then 3D department, right. visual effects. They always like separate things. And it's very hard to like align expectations. It's very hard to avoid, you know, a lot of problems during production. Um, and I think a tool like this, uh, one like immediately for techvers on any production would massively change the way you would think about approaching, uh, you know, big film, for instance, or, uh, or, uh, product vers project. Um, and then we're thinking about it in the, in the early stages of being this pre-production tech vers tool for professionals, but then slowly bridging that parity towards final production mm -hmm. where, you know, now we've got the external camera links. You can use the workflow and all the benefits again, like remote authoring, real, like real time in camera previews far better than like the old simulcam, um, capturing light, lighting data on set. Um, but now being able to stream the sensor data from a cinema camera and have that drive the dy dynamic camera response functions, uh, which is again, that's another thing that we didn't talk about there, but lighting, for example, right. with Simulon, you've seen the HDRI capture part. Um, you know, lighting is such a big part of making something look like it's actually there. And, um, you know, HDRIs have been the go-to way to do that. It's the most intuitive and like easy and minimal data way of getting a photo real result. Um, but, but I mean, you know, the HDRI capture process is either like, either I've got a camera on a nodal head, I'm taking right. like all these pictures and stitching them, or I've got a 360 camera, but I'm still capturing multiple exposures, taking it into Photoshop, combining them, getting an HDRI, normalizing the intensity right. scale. Um, and then forget about how the camera responds to the HDRI. You've just got lighting for like a very specific fixed scenario. Yeah. And the way that we've built it is that all of that stuff gets done for you. So you capture it once as an LDR, yet ML generates an HDRI, is then normalized so that the camera response function of the iPhone is dynamically changing the lighting data every frame. And that's when you see the exposure shifts and the white balance and all this yeah. stuff. Um, and all of those bits result in like the surreal kind of end result. Yeah, so okay, let, let's dig into the tech a little bit because this was something that I was really curious about. Uh, right now, obviously, everybody's talking about AI and generative AI. And right now, as we're recording this, Adobe Max is going on, and they're releasing m way more AI stuff. And so I think what, what I've seen, at least on Twitter, where I found out about you and about Simulon, a lot of the people that are sharing your content are kind of lumping it into the same bucket as, ah, this is an AI tool. And, I, and it sounds like maybe you are using some, you know, you, you mentioned machine learning to turn an LDR. Uh, and for anyone listening who doesn't know that what that means, low dynamic range, when you take a normal photo, uh, there's a pretty clipped amount of, of dynamic range available to you. HDR, you're usually taking, you know, seven or eight of the exact same photo, but with your exposure settings different. And then you're blending those together. You're doing that with machine learning. But how much of what Simulon is doing is using AI or some like brand new technology like that versus what you're doing, you know, versus just combining things that haven't been as accessible. Like an iPhone camera is really pretty good now. And on top of that, there's other sensors on the iPhone that most cameras don't have that can give you depth information and orientation information and, and, and you know, metadata about where you are on planet Earth and what time it was and where the sun is in the sky at that moment, all that stuff. How much of it is brand new AI versus you're just combining technologies that have existed for a while, but not in this one compact little package? Yeah, so we use various um, machine learning um, models. You know, some of them, some of them we've we've kind of done our own implementations of existing research that happen, you know, in the post process pipeline in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And those allow us to do some really interesting things, many of which like we haven't shared yet, um, but there's some really quite surreal stuff that you can do with, you know, combining depth and segmentation and all of this stuff together. Um, so we are using machine learning in various ways. Um, but I'd say when you talk about the 3D industry, uh, you know, graphics technology, rendering, like this stuff is all based on physical reality, you know, part tracing. Uh, you, you can't go beyond what's physically possible let's say. Um, otherwise, you get into the realm of fantasy. Like, if you want to make something feel physically believable, like, these work based on very specific formula. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you're not going to 
innovate how light works. Right, <laughs> you know, right. light works how light works in the world, and it's a very mature industry. Um, you know, and uh, things have looked amazing now in every film we see for good reason mm-hmm. because the stuff is it works the same across. It doesn't matter really if you're using Arnold or V-Ray or Cycles or whatever. They've all reached a certain level where you can kind of achieve the same thing with any render engine, for example. Um, and, you know, compositing is a very well understood um, area. Again, compositing, there's a lot more space for innovation, which we've done a lot of really interesting things where, you know, you're talking about inverse rendering the real world. Um, so, you know, everything, all these 3D engines we're talking about now are all built to forward render. Um, from 3D, calculate everything and then give you an end result. Whereas if you think about the real world, the real world is already rendered in the sense that it's given <laughs> to us as a final result. Right. So you've got to inverse render, work backwards and say like, how does this look in its most basic form? Yeah. And then combine it with all the 3D stuff that it's supposed to be interacting with and then forward render everything back. Um, and then you get the interactions between the real world, the virtual and, and virtual interacting with the real world back as well. Um, so there's, there's some really interesting stuff that we've done there. And I would say, yeah, it's, de- there's definitely no generative AI components about it. We have experiments with generative AI, by the way, um, before. Um, I think it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating piece of technology now, like especially like image and video gen- generation. But I think it has a lot of inherent flaws that I don't think it'll ever overcome. Uh, the biggest one is human intention. Like I don't mm. think it's possible for you to actually crack human intention with generative AI, because the stuff just comes out of the ether. Yeah. I mean, you can get closer to having a human guide the process, but you'll never be able to tell me what you're about to get. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you'll never be able with full surety. Um, and I think this is going to be especially true when you talk about combining the real world and the virtual. Um, you have to have, you know, temporal geometric consistency interactions between things that are happening in real life that's all physically accurate with stuff that's happening in the virtual world. The only way really to achieve that is to understand how to create a physics-based system that can, I guess, extrapolate as many of these things as possible and have them interact with each other. So we will experiment with generative AI in the background. I think for me, it's, it's it's more interesting as a conceptual idea, explorative tool. Um, as opposed to producing things that you intend to create, like you have a very specific idea in your head. Um, and our goal is to really, you know, tackle that part of it. Yeah. You know, I have a really specific thing I want to do and I can do it quite easily. So it sounds like, you know, there, there's innovation on, the, there is some truly like new things you're doing, like, you know, the, the exchange format, you know, but, but it sounds like mostly this is an innovation of you're combining a whole bunch of techniques that have already existed, but they've been very segmented. And I think earlier when you were talking about the way a traditional visual effects pipeline works, you know, I, I think you nailed it. I mean, you know, there, there's departments and, you know, and then between there's departments in a company and then that company is separate from the production company that's shooting the thing often, um, especially in the, in the world of commercials. So are there other are there other things, though? So like the turning an LDR image into an HDR image using machine learning. I've never I, maybe that's existed. And it just hasn't been on my radar. Um but, but looking at the demo of this that you posted on Twitter, like the interface and all of that is really, really cool. Are there other things that you're doing that haven't really been done this way before? You know, as an example, I'm curious how you deal with occlusion. One of the, one of the, the clips that you just posted, your hand starts in front of an object and then it goes behind it. And there's, you know, to this day, like still rotoscoping, whether it's, you know, assisted through AI or not, or it's just a human doing it. That's still basically the way that's mo- that's done most of the time. Are you doing anything there? Um, are you using the geometry of the scene to do things like that? I'm curious, like what else, what what other things is Simulon capable of that doesn't really exist elsewhere? Sure. So yeah, on the occlusion side, you know, we're we are generating a combined um, Z-depth buffer, um, which is basically including the real world Mm -hmm. um, inferred through machine learning combined with a rendered buffer from the actual 3D scene and then normalizing those so that they're in the right geometric space. Um, There's still, you know, work to do on this to have it be totally flawless. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot of challenges with inferred depth. Um, As you might know, when you talk about video especially, you've got temporal and geometric consistency issues um, where 
you know, you're inferring this stuff, but if you want to use it for, you know, functional use case, it becomes quite tricky. And to do it in any time that makes sense in a product that people can actually use, um, you know, you're doing that at very low resolutions. Right. And if you're scaling up something that's like a 360p or a 560p, like um, infer depth map, and you're scaling it to 4K footage, right? You know, you're, Not you're look asking good, yeah. for artifacts. Yeah. <laughs> so we're doing some interesting things where we use a combined Z depth buffer, and then we also use a separate segmentation process to segment humans and objects at high resolution and then use them together with the depth buffer to sort of te test those things in space, those masks in space, wow. so we get much more high-frequency detail. Um, our goal with that is that a human being, you know, with hair, with clothing, and that can walk in front, in and around virtual objects within the world and be properly occluded where, you know, there was no sort of manual rotoscoping work and things like that involved. Um, and you didn't have to sort of key things on and off to say, okay, it's now in front of, it's now behind of, like... Ideally, it's just able to understand the depth of that space and then use a segmentation mask when it's required and then you get a beautiful output. Yeah. That's the holy grail for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we've made amazing progress on that actually. Um, I, you know, I think we, we want to take the route of like, we only put it out there when we know it's amazing, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it works perfectly. Um, and that's kind of also the ethos of how we've been building is, you know, we want to strive for something that, uh, you know, is as close to an end result as possible. Um, so this stuff is all in R&D at the moment. You know, there's some really crazy stuff that, you know, where we combine that as well with material acquisition. We're working with other interesting startups as well in the space on collaborative bits for like relighting humans into virtual scenes. So you, you kind of spoke about it earlier. Yeah, you had the idea of if you created a digital set extension based on the physical world and it's all anchored to that space so a human can interact with that space. And what if we want to change that into I'm um, now in like the sci-fi hull, for example, um, and that human that I recorded needs to be accurately placed there, but with all the lighting of that space, I'm um, interacting with that human and that human interacting back. So they're reflecting in the metals and things. How do we make that all just work? Right. Um, and we've, we've made, you know, uh, amazing progress, more than uh, most people would think. Let's say uh, hopefully we're going to be sharing stuff on that next couple of weeks. That's really wild. Uh, have you explored at all? I mean, I'm sure you have, but <laughs> this is kind of a leading question. But, you know, you've mentioned that a lot of the assets or, or all the assets you've been talking about, I assume, are just traditional 3D geometry. But there's also been some amazing progress and some really impressive demos I've seen of, you know, it seemed like six months ago it was neural radiance fields and now it's Gaussian splatting. Um, but either way, you're, it's a way to represent a 3D object very realistically without geometry, is from what I understand. So, um, and I, I have a feeling you understand it far better than me. So maybe you could just briefly explain what you know about these techniques, Gaussian splatting, uh, it primarily, and and are you using that? Or are you thinking of implementing that with Simulon? Yeah, Gaussian splatting is like the new, um, you know, view dependent representation of a 3D object or a scene. Um, you know, this all started like initially a couple of years ago, uh, like six years ago, you know, we worked on a project also, which was a physical exhibition and we used surface light fields there, like a very rudimentary um, version of, of, of light fields at the time. And, you know, that was like, uh, some people might, might remember like Google's Surat project and things where you're now taking uh, a complex scene and trying to simplify it into like little polygons mm -hmm. in space and projecting textures and making them view dependent depending on the camera angle. And that then got into MPIs, like multi-plane images. Uh, if you remember, there was a whole rage about this at the time and Google had some really interesting uh, projects around multi-plane images and they did it with video as well. And it's just like stacked, it's almost like the original um, Disney uh, process of having like stacked glass yeah. and then you create perspective. Um, but it's essentially just taking a you know, video feed and then having it stacked in space so you could just move um, your view mm -hmm. around. You know, that was like really cool because you could get quite high resolution like outputs and then you could basically get all of that stuff into an atlas and stream it for video. I actually think that that's the way Vision Pro is going to do it. I'm not 100% sure because I haven't like talked to anyone about right. it, but the spatial video thing that they talk about, I'm 
pretty convinced that it's like a an MPI scene representation that you can like move around. You view it in like a holographic oh, window, okay. and you can like move around it and get the depth and and view dependent effects. Um, and then yeah, enough. Uh, you know, enough came about and that like changed everything and super amazing that you could get a complex real world environment um, that you could then explore and post. Um, I think that was amazing. Um, and then, yeah, Gaussian splatting now is just basically drop the neural part, you know, and that's that's allowed it to become a lot faster and uh, a lot faster to train and a lot faster to uh, to actually render. Uh, you, you've seen now that it's basically rendering in real time. Mm-hmm. And we did a, you know, we did a version, uh, well, a test with our app, um, where we created a Gaussian splat of a mecha in a physical location. And that's kind of leading into something that we've been building towards. So, you know, we are right now thinking of ways that we can have an object placed in the physical world through our app, um, where you've got all of the lighting information and all of the things that we do. And we can automatically generate without you needing to like go and physically move around, automatically generate a Gaussian split, which is like basically a, like a part traced representation of that object in the physical world. So if you think about the head example I shared yesterday, imagine the photo real version mm-hmm. being placed in that location in the world in real time. Um, and the idea there is obviously being able to experience it with a uh, mixed reality headset. Uh, I think could result in quite a profound shared experience as well because we can share the AR world map. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talk, you know, in relation to Gaussian splatting with um, use cases like being able to view what a couch is going to look like in your room. You know, hold your phone up and there's the couch. But it's not a because of that technology. It's so realistic. I mean, it's it's crazy. How much control do you have with Gaussian splatting over? the lighting of that object is the lighting baked into that or can you change it once you've captured it yeah the lighting is all baked into it um i've seen you know when it comes to dynamic making these gaussian splats dynamic um there's been some interesting approaches i read one paper where they're actually like transforming and stretching the the, the ellipsoids over time yeah. um and that that's kind of like having a baked if you think about it like a baked like say you bake lighting in a game right. Um, on a character, and then the character was just moving with that baked lighting. That's kind of what you're going to get. You know, you're not going to get dynamic shadows and things um, in the, uh, in that scene. But then, the guys have been doing some really cool uh, demos on on actual like volumetric dynamic Gaussian splats or infinite realities. Um, that would be awesome if you check them out. Uh, we've been chatting with them about a bunch of things, um, and we're working with them on some stuff as well. And they've done some tests where it basically built uh, a Gaussian splat every single frame. And you're unloading and reloading a Gaussian splat every frame. So you've got this volumetric playback. Um, and it's pretty crazy. I mean, it feels like it's out of a sci-fi film, like seeing they did this demo with the dog. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. I have seen moving Gaussian splats, and it, it's it's wild. It really is. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it does have, you know, these stuff, these sort of, representations at a single point in space and time um, or or not space but rather time they do have their inherent limitations especially when it comes to like making things dynamic if you want things to move so in the real world you know if you want to have sort of volumetric memory let's say of a real world location with humans moving in it and stuff that's very difficult to do because you have to be capturing it from a whole bunch of angles with us that obviously becomes possible because of the fact that like the digital object is that's being inserted into the world, it can s- exist independently from the world itself. So, you know, we have that object in the cloud and we can create a virtual array of cameras and build a Gaussian splat for how it would exist being inserted into the real world. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that does. And would that just there, be a performance yeah. benefit? Does it render faster, easier than doing 3D geometry? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, we would only be able to re- render like a rasterized version of it in real time. Right. Um, and you know that has all the limitations of uh, what a real time engine looks like. Yeah. Being able to stream in the Gaussian splat would mean like a full photorealistic version of it. I'm a firm believer that you know mixed reality, especially with headsets, it's never going to really reach its true potential until it sort of crosses that that point where it becomes a profound experience. Mm-hmm. It's so realistic that you totally believe it's there, and especially if you can share that with others. 
And I think yeah, where Gaussian splat in that case could be quite cool is in like an educational setting or like a museum type setting where you've got a group of people and you can very quickly build a photoreal representation of a digital object, uh, an animal, a, a human, a whatever, a uh, mecca. And right. you can experience that together with other human beings. But it's, it feels like I could literally just reach out and touch, like it's actually there. And I think when you get to that point and it has that profound impact on people, that's when people are truly going to realize the potential of mixed reality. Yeah, it's going to be the holodeck. So what um what other technologies are out there right now that that you and your team are looking at? You know, like our audience is probably going to be familiar with a lot of the things we've been talking about generative AI, radiance fields, Gaussian splatting. What are the new white papers and things that that you're looking at that you think could be a big deal in the next, you know, 5 10 years? I think I think you know, inverse rendering, which is what we've been working on, I think that that that's going to become a lot more useful over time, um, being able to get like spatially variant lighting in real time in the real space and have that you know interactive within an engine. I think that you know that stuff could become possible at some point. Um, I think the stuff that Meta's done with the codec avatars is really cool. Yeah. That paper is a really interesting read, and like that was, I mean, that was mind blowing for me to see. <laughs> that that interview with yeah Lex, with Lex Friedman like, yeah it's like whoa you know this is <laughs> this is like Matrix level I think they also made it like the white room and everything yeah. like it felt like it was in the Matrix so I'd say that that stuff is pretty cool there's a lot of really interesting things happening in like health tech uh, that is quite exciting I know that's a separate part but I think it's equally as important and I think people should get excited about this stuff because it's probably you know it's it's it's, it's far more important than like the stuff that we are doing for example I think in the interactive media space I think to be honest everything is sort of at the edge and live for everyone to see right now like the I've never seen implementation this fast before um, like Gaussian splats for example you know that is right now that's like the state of the art like that's at the edge and it went from research to being implemented in tools like luma mm -hmm. um and polycam like very 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 even quickly. unreal engine now i so, think there's a plugin that you can bring in gaussian splats yeah and i think yeah that's that's kind of the the, the nature of how things have changed now you know uh papers are like papers from a week ago are being surpassed by stuff that's happening like yeah this week and then papers from two weeks ago are being implemented into like commercial products and stuff you know now and it's pretty crazy the pace that it's all moving at but i would say i'd say yeah there's there's some companies doing interesting things and i personally i look for you know the taste of the company the what their kind of intention looks like and how they think about things holistically like the design the experience you know, a lot of things are going to become commoditized, I personally feel like. Um, and I think the things that will really stand out is who really cares about the creator experience, who really cares about creative people. So you're building it for their benefits, ultimately. Um, and there's some yeah, really cool uh, startups out there. I'd say, you know, Luma is definitely one of them. Like Beeble.ai is another one. Like we have been talking with quite a lot. I think we're going to do some really cool stuff together. Um, yep, infinite realities again on like capturing like volumetric humans and things is really really cool. And then yeah, there's there's all the big players as well. But the startups are really exciting in the space. That's super cool. Well, my last question, Devesh, and thank you for for doing this and for uh, you know for telling us all about Simulon, is when can our audience expect to actually be able to get their hands on this? Maybe you can tell us a little bit just about the roadmap for the product. Sure. So we're going into closed beta, like very 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 soon. We are basically finalizing some last bits about user experience. It is a tool that operates across, you know, there's one end-to-end -end solution, which is just from mobile, but there's obviously the stuff we talked about, the 3D plugins, a, a desktop app that we've got. This, it's quite a big, big project mm -hmm. overall. Um, so that's going into the whole thing is going into closed beta now. The next like month or so is kind of our timeline. And that's, you know, people from industry that we've been working with for a number of years and we've got really good relationships with and we want to get high quality feedback as possible in making sure the user experience is really seamless and everything is amazing. Um, and then we're looking at our public release early next year. Um, so that could be Q1, Q2 next year. Um, that's obviously depending on the next little while of progress. We are a small team, so 
depending on you know, how much work there is from the closed beta, I would say safe to assume that like we're looking at early next year for access to everyone. Intrigued? Follow Devesh on X slash Twitter or LinkedIn at Devesh Naidu. Links will be in the description or at schoolofmotion.com in this episode's show notes, which by the way, will contain links to anything we talked about here. I wanna thank him for his time and for his ambition. What his team is building is a huge challenge, but based on what I've seen so far, they're gonna pull it off and open up the world of high-end visual effects to a lot more people. And we're all for that here at School of Motion. Oh, and do me a quick favor, hit that like button and subscribe if you're not already because we have some incredible podcast episodes coming your way, including our epic 2023 end of the year roundup episode. That's called a tease, by the way, in the business. And that is it for this episode. Thank you so much. I'll catch you on the next one.